All right, so last Wednesday, we talked about the four modes of convergence of a sequence of, of random variables. We wrote x, n, right? And how it might converge to a random variable x as its limit. So I will first do a recap on what we talked about last time. We talked about four modes, primarily four modes, but there's another one in the end. So the first one is convergence in law. Sometimes we also write it as convergence in distribution. So I want everyone to just quickly think about what the definition is, and then you can compare your memory to what I have here. So this is defined as based on the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of each random variable in the sequence and in the limit. So basically we define this as fxn, the CDF of xn evaluated at any point, point x should converge the CDF of X at the same point, we want, we want this to hold for any X for which, which is the continuity point of this limiting CDF. So in other words, I'll just write it in short as this, which this is a set of continuity points of FX. And for any continuity point, we must have this point wise convergence. And of course here, we have the convergence as n goes to infinity. That's what we talk about, large sample. This is the first mode, convergence and law. So what's special about this is that it has no requirement on the dependence between x, n, and x. They may be independent or they may be completely dependent. Both will work as long as there's a relationship for their CDF functions. So no dependence between xn and x, or I would say, probably better way to say dependence between x and x doesn't matter. And this is the only mode that doesn't consider dependence. The remaining ones, the remaining three will have the dependence into consideration. The second one is an important one, convergence in probability. What's the definition? If we recall the intuition we gave you, it's about the distance between those two, whether it exceeds epsilon or not, right? And given the epsilon neighborhood size, we want the probability that their difference, absolute difference is greater than epsilon. We want that probability go down to zero. That's the definition. So any epsilon greater than zero, we need the probability x n minus x greater than epsilon converge to zero as n goes to infinity. And just a note here is that this is the joint probability of x n and x. Don't forget about this. And also, as a reminder, we talk about the exact definition of this convergence. We can use delta as the violation for this probability. And we just want to say, okay, for any delta and epsilon positive, there exists an N conditioning or depending on delta and epsilon such that for all the N that, that's greater than that particular N, we have this inequality satisfied, right? So, oh, sorry, for that, we have this less or equal than inequality hope. So just check that definition so you can better understand what this limit means. Okay, this is convergence in probability. The third one is the convergence in the rth mean for a positive r. So the definition of this is based on the expectation of x n minus x raised to the power r. This should converge to zero as n goes to infinity. And here, the expectation is also for the joint distribution of x n and x. So in other words, mode two and mode three are concerning some average or expectation. 
It's just that here, the expectation is for the rth powered absolute difference. Well, here, the expectation is for the binarized difference, right? Whether it's greater than epsilon, we call it one, no matter how large it is, we have this truncation, but here we don't have the truncation. And also, mode two and mode three, by emphasizing that the probability and expectation depend, depend on the joint distribution, we know that the dependence between X and N, X, N, and X would matter here and here, but it doesn't matter here. Okay, lastly, almost sure convergence. Okay, what's this definition? We gave you two definitions. Maybe I would move there because it's too bottom. The first definition is that we have every realization of my random sequence converge to the corresponding realization of my random variable X. And this holds with probability one. So basically what this says is every sequence converges to the limit. An alternative definition we talked about last time looks like this form. And basically we spell out in that second, in the second definition, what the limit inside the probability means. So over there we have for any positive epsilon, we have the probability that xk minus x is less or equal than epsilon for all k greater than n. We have this converge to one as n goes to infinity. So in other words, what we have here is that inside the probability, it's not just n, maybe I could put this here. And it's not just n itself satisfied that x n minus x is less or equal than that epsilon. We need all the random variables after n to satisfy this. And essentially you can see this means convergence, right? Because you can shrink the epsilon to be very, very small. No matter how small the epsilon is, you can always, because this n is going to infinity, you can always find some later part of the sequence that's so for which the subsequence is always in the epsilon neighborhood of x. So that's why this one's stronger than this one. And the reason we want to give this alternative definition is to make it clear for you that this is stronger than that and implies that. And that will be a very important result. So to make this even more clear for you, you know, this one can be written equivalently as So then you can see both are convergent to one. It's just that this one is about xm particularly. Well, that is for x one, for xn, xm plus one, and so on, everything afterwards. Okay, so these are the four modes. And the fifth, which is not really what we call the mode in the definition, but it's also some convergence when we talk about that is this one. expectation of xn converging to the expectation of x. And we know that it's different from all the above four. And also this one, just similar to the first one convergence in law has nothing to do with dependence. Dependence does not matter also. Okay. So, in, in the following, I'm going to give you some results about what implies what among those relationships. And also I'll give you some countering examples so you can see some doesn't imply others. 
So for the counter examples, if it, if it is something you find difficult to concretize in your mind, my suggestion is that once you go back, you try to do simulation on your computer. Then you can see concretely what a sequence look like in each realization. And then you can see why we say, oh, it's convergence almost surely. It's not convergence in the art mean. You'll see an example for that. Or it's convergence in the art mean, but not convergence almost surely. So these will help you understand what we're talking about. Okay, so any questions for what we have reviewed so far? Okay, good. So now we will talk about, oh, something I need to finish up. I just leave a little, talk about a little about this fifth. I'll just wrap it up, but it's not really connected to what we'll talk about later. So I just make it a side note. So one thing we want to say is that if you just have almost sure convergence, you may not get this. This may seem a little counterintuitive, but it is the case. Why is that? The reason is that even though this almost sure convergence tells us that in every realization, we have a real number sequence that converge to a real limit, right? However, it's possible that at every position xn, if I look across my realizations, there may be some outlier number in one particular realization so that the expectation may stay very large and it doesn't converge to the expectation of the limit, even though every sequence itself does converge. And we will see an example about this later, but the intuition is that if this one has some outliers, you may have an issue here. So to actually make sure this doesn't happen, there are two theoretical results, theorems to guarantee this. One is called a monotone convergence theorem. So this one is just to say, if my random sequence is monotone increasing and non-negative, then this will happen for sure. So that is if we have something like this, a monotone non-decreasing sequence and Xn converges almost surely to X, then expectation of Xn converges to expectation of X. This is the first result. And we have, we give it, we gave you the proof in the notes. So you can see that basically we try to use this monotone relationship to guarantee that we can go from this limit per se to expectation. So we want, we know as long as this is under a monotone relationship, we can add expectation and expectation is also under a monotone relationship. That's the key. And the second result is called the dominated convergence theorem. You can see that this one has a limitation by requiring the random variables to be non-negative, while this one doesn't have that requirement. Okay, so what this says is that if we have all the xn's with absolute value under another random variable whose expectation is finite. So this random variable y needs to have a finite expectation, which means that this cannot be very large. Okay, so its expectation must be controlled. So it may have some radically large numbers, real numbers, but once you take expectation, it's under control. And we have the almost sure convergence. So with those, we have the expectation converges. Okay, so 
both of them are trying to just control our random sequence in a way so that we can guarantee that with the almost sure convergence, it's not going to be affected by some radically large numbers so that the expectation doesn't converge. Okay, so I think this is something you may want to spend a little time to think about if it's new to you. Actually, the monotone convergence theorem and dominated convergence theorem were some results where this is the special case of the from measure theory. So in the they, they are results in the measure theory. It's just that we apply them to probability, which is a special case, special measure. Okay, so now coming back to those four in law, in probability, in arts mean, and almost surely, what are their relationships? So we will give you three important relationships about them. So probably I will draw a diagram to help everyone understand. Yeah, I'll erase this part first because it's not that crucial to the discussion. Okay, so I will put it here. So convergence in law is here and convergence, or maybe I'll drop the arrow to avoid confusion. Convergence in law, convergence in probability, and convergence almost surely, and convergence in the Rth mean. Okay, so for those, the first result we will give you is that convergence almost surely implies convergence in probability. So why is that? We will prove this first. So actually the alternative definition already gave us the proof. So you can see that whenever this event holds, right? Then this event would hold. So therefore that is a more, that, is, that event is nested under this event. In other words, we can have the probability for any epsilon greater than zero, the probability xm minus x is less or equal than epsilon, okay? This event contains this event. So it's greater or equal than the probability xk minus x less or equal than epsilon for any k greater or equal than m. And we know this one goes to one because we have almost sure convergence. And then you know, because this is greater or equal than, and we know probability cannot be greater than one, then we have this convergence to one. So we have convergence and probability. That's it. So does it make sense to everyone? Right, so that's why this alternative definition is introduced to assist with this understanding. And intuitively, how do we interpret it, right? So almost surely tells us in every realization, the sequence converges to a limit. So therefore, we could imagine that for this epsilon, right, we can actually go to some n such that we would have this xn within the neighborhood, within the epsilon neighborhood in every realization. And that's what we want. Then we have the convergence in probability. So this is just intuitive to think, okay, the almost sure convergence will ensure that in every realization, as far as I go late into my sequence, I can always find some xn. And after that, the x and minus x will be less or equal than epsilon. And you will see that the truncation will be very helpful so that this, we will not really bother by some very large xn in the sequence because no matter how large it is, then this truncation will make the probability small. And we will see the counter example so you can understand why we can have almost sure in convergence imply probability convergence 
but not the rth mean convergence. We'll see a counterexample. The reason is just because in the rth mean, we have this power and also the absolute difference, which is not truncated. Okay, so this is the first result. The second result is that convergence in rth mean will, convert, will imply convergence in probability. Why is that? So this is something we call the generalization of the Chebyshev's inequality. So the trick here is that we want to connect those two, right? And you see here, they share some similarities. Both are concerning the absolute difference between X n and X. And both are some sort of expectation. This is an expectation of an indicator function. This is an expectation of the arc power function. We want to make a connection of those two. And this is a very common technique used in probability. That is to make a connection with the epsilon, right? What we can do is that, and also this is for any epsilon positive, we can just divide this into two cases, whether x and minus x are greater than epsilon or less or equal than epsilon. So you see, this is equal to, let me just put it this way, x n minus x to the power r indicator function, x n minus x is greater than epsilon. That's the first term. And the second term is x n minus x to the power r indicator x m minus x is less or equal than epsilon. So the reason why this holds, why this holds is because you see these two indicator functions, only one of them can take value one and the other must be value zero. So that's why their sum is equal to one. Okay. And what else? So you see, because both terms are non-negative, right? So this is non-negative. So I can write greater or equal than and only keep the first term because the first term involves the thing I want for my convergence and probability. So therefore I can write it as expectation of this to the power to the times indicator. Okay, right? So the second term must be non-negative. So that's why we change the equal sign to a greater equal sign. And then this will help us. We know that this is non-zero only when, so the term inside expectation is non-zero, only when this absolute difference is greater than epsilon. So we know this term, we can actually find epsilon as a lower bound for this term and move it out as a constant. So we can write this as, okay, epsilon to the power r times expectation of the indicator. This is actually the probability. Right, and this is what we call the general case of Chebyshev's inequality. You see, if I divide this part to this part, and if you remember that the, the one we taught in our undergrad class is r equals two, the square, that this is what we call the variance, and this is the epsilon square. Okay, so with this, then you can see when this left-hand side goes down to zero as n go to infinity, and this is a lower bound of that, right? We will have this go down to zero and we get a proof. Does that make sense? The reason we can have this is of course, this part is bounded by zero from below. And also this one goes to zero as n goes to infinity. 
So we have zero here, zero there, then the probability will go down to zero. And this is because in our proof, we first fix epsilon. And for any epsilon fixed, we can have the convergence of the probability to zero. All right, any questions about this part? Almost sure of Rth mean convergence implies convergence in probability. Okay, and the third important result is convergence in probability implies convergence in luck. So you see with these three relationships, it gives us a very nice result. So if you want to prove convergence in probability, you could go with proving almost sure convergence or convergence in R thing, depending on which one is easier. And with convergence in probability, you would directly obtain convergence in law. So therefore, and it's interesting that sometimes it's not, it's not that the weaker result is easier to prove, not always the case. Even though almost sure convergence is the, seem to be very strong, right? But actually, it's not that easy to use in proofs. The reason is that almost sure convergence is very similar to the limit we have for real sequence, for real sequence of numbers, a sequence of real numbers. Because you see, the limit happens inside the probability. So any transformation you could apply to the real number convergence, you could apply here. So for example, if you have a continuous function f, we know that if you apply f to xn and f to x, we can still have the convergence. And that is from the convergence of numbers. So we can still have that here. And then, so for almost sure convergence, you will easily have fxn converges almost surely to fx. And then you can talk about other things. And you're, you cannot so easily use that result with the three other types of convergence. Okay. So how about the third result? How can we prove it, right? So to prove that the convergence in probability implies convergence in law, what are the connections between those two? Both involve probability. However, you see, what is this probability, this fx and x, I'll write it here. This is actually probability x n less or equal than x. That's the definition of CDF. This is probability x greater or equal than x. So to prove that this converts to this, we want to make use of what we have in here. That's our condition, convergence and probability. This talks about the absolute difference between x n and x. So here the intuition is that if we have convergence in probability, it means that in every realization, the sequence will get close to the limit in many realizations, okay? So this will happen in many realizations. And then we can imagine for the random variable Xn itself, its distribution, will become more and more like the distribution of X. Otherwise, and this is actually guaranteed by this force that drives the two things closer together as N goes up. So with that, then the distribution, marginal distribution of XM should be more alike the marginal distribution of X. All right, so with this intuition, we just need to express this mathematically. So let's first take a look at the case. I'll erase this part. Let's first take a look. Okay, let's first take a look at what we want. Okay, the probability xn less or equal than x. When this happens, and when this happens, what will be X like? Okay, so let's think about it. Okay, so I'm just talking about a one dimensional case for simplicity. So suppose that X 
is here and my x n is on the left of it because of this action this is the event right and how about x so i know that my x if my x is within the small neighbor absolute neighborhood of x so So if my x is somewhere here, then what's the maximum x can take? Given that xn is less or equal than x, then what's the maximum x can take? Someone say the answer? And x plus epsilon, right? Because when xn reaches x, then x, the maximum of x is x plus epsilon, but it can never go beyond that. Okay, so if xn minus x is less or equal than epsilon, then x is less or equal than x plus epsilon. Or xn minus x is greater than epsilon. So basically, I'm saying that there are two cases about x, either here or here. But when it's here, then we could actually know that this will be the case. So in other words, what we can say from this is that this probability it should be. Okay, let me put it this way. So basically, I'm going to write it out more explicitly so it makes more sense to you. So basically, I will write it as xn less or equal than x and xn minus x less or equal than epsilon plus probability xn less or equal than x, xn minus x, greater than epsilon, okay? So I just spell out those two cases. And for the first case, I know this implies this. And so therefore, I know the event that's implied in it, it's greater than the event here, right? So when A implies B, I know probability of A is less or equal than probability of B. So this is less or equal than the probability that x is less or equal than x plus epsilon because that's a greater event. And the second thing is what? The second thing is here. And I know I can drop this by enlarging the probability plus the probability xn minus x is greater than epsilon. So I found an upper bound for this one. And similarly, now I want to talk about x. What happens when I want the probability of x minus or equal than x minus epsilon? Just for, just for symmetry, you know, I have plus epsilon here. I want to know what's minus epsilon. And here, I, what, I want, what, I can, what I can do here is use this relationship, but swap x n and x. You see, I can do it because it, the, the two are symmetrical in my discussion, right? In this difference, the two are symmetrical. So if I swap those two and replace this by x minus epsilon, then you see, I would have this becomes with a swap. This is x n minus or equal than. This is x minus epsilon plus epsilon. So I get x and this stays by symmetry. So you see what I have. By combining those two inequalities and put this in the center, I would have, I will now go back to the CDF notation. So we are done. So I'm just going to move this term to this side. I actually have fx 
okay? X minus epsilon minus the probability Xn minus X greater than epsilon less or equal than Fxn at X. And this one less or equal than Fx at X plus epsilon plus the probability Xn minus X greater than epsilon. So you see, I have the CDFs here and I need a CDF to prove convergence in law. Now you see, when I let N go to infinity, what happens? By the convergence in probability, you see this term will go down to zero. That's what I say, the force to push Xn to X. This will go down to zero. This will go down to zero. Then the inequality becomes fx at x minus epsilon is less or equal than fx and x, less or equal than fx at x plus epsilon. Then what's next? A key condition will get into play. X must be a continuity point of fx. So, you know, all the discussion here is for any positive x, epsilon, sorry. Now with, okay, I'm going to erase this because this, this is going down to zero and this is going down to zero. So with this, if I let epsilon go down to zero on the positive side, then you see if x is a continuity point, then this and this will both converge to fxx. And then I'm done. So then you can see that this fxn at x will converge to fx at x. But you can see that when x is not a continuity point of x, then when I let epsilon go down to zero, this and this may not have the same limit as epsilon go down to zero. So this proof itself also shows that the continuity point is necessary. And we showed a counter example in the last class that, yeah, without the continuity point constraint, there may be cases where we have the convergence in law, but there is a continu this continuity point where this doesn't converge to this. All right, so I would say, this is the most important result regarding the four modes of convergence. And now I'm going to give you some counter examples to show that, okay, so this convergence in the rth mean doesn't imply convergence almost surely. So the first counter example, so this doesn't happen. So in this counter example, based on the intuition we gave, right? To make the, the convergence not almost surely, we want every realization to have a non-converging sequence. But we want to make sure on average in the arc mean, there is convergence. So that's the basic of our construction. And also for all these counter example constructions, we often make the sequence XM to be a sequence where the random variables are dependent. And that's easier to manipulate the case. So we can see how it happens. So here, I'm just going to give you an example to see, yeah, we can construct a sequence like this. So basically here in the example, we just define a random variable uniform in zero to one. And we define X to be X one, the first one in the sequence to be one. 
And the second one to be an indicator regarding whether the Z falls on the first half of the interval. So when Z falls onto this interval, X2 takes what value one, otherwise zero. This is for the second half of the interval. So by this construction, we make sure that when X2 is one, X3 must be zero. So they are exclusive. They cannot both be one. And then I'll further divide this interval into one half. So you can see, I will have X4 is one fourth and X5 is from one fourth to one half and so on. So I will have four random variables here and only one of them is going to take value one. The other three must be zero. So, and so on. So I further divide the interval zero to one into finer and finer intervals. So to generalize this, we can do a simple math and find, okay, so if the xn, the n I have here, the integer can be written as two to the power of k plus the remainder n. So this is the number of times I divide the interval into. Right, so if that's the case, then what I will have is that, so, so because this is a remainder, so we must have m less equal than two to the power of k. And if we have that, then xn can be written as the indicator of the interval m times power two to the negative k to m plus one two to the power negative k in this interval z. So I can have that. And then you can see by the construction, we will see every sequence will not be convergent because let's say if I happen to have z just for example, in one realization, let's see z equals one half. Then what would be the corresponding sequence? The sequence would be x1 equals one, x2 equals zero, x3 equals, let me see, x3 equals one, right? And then x4 is zero, x5, zero, x6, one, x7, zero. And you can see that I will always have a one somewhere. So it will not stay at zero by the construction. So like here, when is this two to the power K plus M, right? So basically I know now the intervals divided into K or I would say two to the K sub intervals. And out of the two to the K sub intervals, one of them must take value one. So I know this is never a convergence sequence, but how about the convergence in arc mean? Let's take a look. So if I want to say here, so first of all, if I say I do the calculation of Xn, and I'm guessing that because as I go along the sequence, zero is getting more and more often, one is less and less often. So my guess is that the limit is zero. And let's see if that's it, that's it. So if I evaluate this term and you see, because my Xn is only one or zero, two values. So this expectation is simply the probability that xn is one, right? It's just because the rth power of one is one. 
Okay, and what is this? Now let's look at this, right? So by the definition, it is the probability that Z falls onto this interval. Uh, sorry. That's the probability I want to calculate, right? And because Z is uniform zero to one, the probability is the interval length. Okay, and I know this is, and also because of this relationship, don't forget, we find K based on N. As n goes to infinity, k goes to infinity. So therefore, as n goes to infinity, k goes to infinity, and this go down to zero. So indeed, we have convergence in the rth mean. And this example also can be used as a counterexample to say that convergence in probability doesn't imply almost sure convergence. It's also an example for that. Because you see here, when I say for any epsilon positive, the probability xn minus zero greater than epsilon, because xn here is one or zero, is also equal to probability xn equals to one. So the arguments follow. So we can use this as a case to show, yeah, we have convergence in the arc mean and the convergence in the probability because these two convergences only concern the average across realizations. As long as in my construction, one appear less and less often, yeah, then I'll have both. But for every particular realization, I will constantly get a one somewhere in the sequence. So I don't have convergence in that sequence at all. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is the first counter example to show, yeah, we cannot go from R to AS or P to AS. But also interestingly, we also cannot go from almost sure convergence to the R mean. So I'm going to show an example here. In this example, I'm going to create a case where the sequence is rising as n goes to infinity in the realization. And after a while, it will drop down to zero and stay at zero. So then we will see every realization converge, converges to zero. However, because it's rising so fast before it reaches zero, so when I take the you know, expectation. Expectation will stay high and will, expectation will not converge. We'll see that. And this will actually be the case when the MCT, monotone convergence theorem and the dominated convergence theorem, you will see why they are necessary. Okay, so almost sure convergence doesn't imply convergence in the rth mean. Why is that? Still, we are going to create Z uniform zero to one. This is a very easy, this is very easy to manipulate. So we can use this to create random variables. And here we define XM as exponential growth in two to the power n, but we have this indicator function about whether it's in the interval, shrinking interval from zero to one over n. So what does this mean? So you can see that, I can give you one example. Let's say my z is again one half. When I draw, I draw my z in this way, then you see what happens. Then x1, so it's from zero to one. I'm good. So I have one here and two to the one is two. But x2, 
z is not in zero to one half because this is an open. So I will get zero. And you see after that, everything will be zero. So I will stay at zero in, the, in this realization. Then how about z is one fourth? Then you see x1 is two, x2 will go to four because I still have one here and zero and afterwards. So you see, depending on what z takes, then the sequence will change accordingly. But if z is extremely small, then I may have many of my xn's to grow exponentially until you reach zero. Okay, so that's the intuition. And you can see, we do have almost sure convergence in the realizations. But how about the arc mean, if I take expectation? You can see something, I make this exponential growth. It's just trying to say, oh, here the growth is so fast. Then if I take average, even though many of the realizations are zero, but the average may still be large because of the exponential growth. Okay, so. Let's do the calculation. X n minus zero, because the almost sure convergence we know it goes to zero, right? Every sequence goes to zero. So the limit is zero, but we want to see whether we have the rth mean convergence. So what is that? Because everything is non-negative and so this is easy, right? So I would actually have this as the expectation of two to the power n r rth power times the indicator of this zero one to the zero two one over n z. Okay, and this is actually the probability two to the power n r times the probability that z is in the interval. And because z is uniform zero to one, we know that probability is one over n. And now it's clear, right? So after taking expectation, unfortunately, this growth still dominate. As n goes to infinity, this will go to infinity, not go down to zero. This implies we have, we don't have convergence in the arc mean, even though we do have almost sure convergence. And you can see that the reason here is that this term is actually not controlled. We, we don't, we cannot really have an upper bound moment. Okay, so does that make sense to everyone? All right, so then this is the general rule, right? The relationship between these types of convergence. And although we cannot go backwards, for example, we cannot say convergence in law implies convergence in probability. This doesn't hold for sure. However, we do have some important partial converses to that that are worth talking about. So I'm going to talk about them next. So the first important partial converse is that convergence in law may imply convergence in probability. Let me just say this. If the limit is a constant, okay, and this is very important because if we want to prove some important results, that is, this is my you know estimator, depending on sample size n. If I want to show my estimator converges in probability to the true parameter value, and in statistics we call this consistency. If I want to pro prove this consistency, we, I may just prove this convergence law. 
And we will have we will give you a lot of results about convergence and law in the future lectures. So this is something we can prove with a lot of tools at hand. So this is a nice result. And why is that? And also know that if this limit is a random variable, then this may not hold. Okay, so it's only, and you can imagine why. So I, I give you the example. So for convergence and law, I only care about their marginal distributions. And if this is random variable, it could be independent with Xn, independent of Xn. So therefore their values have no connections. So it doesn't imply convergence and probability. But when it's a constant, the star is different because constant just stay there as a point mass, it doesn't move, right? So whenever it, this, Xn has its distribution convergent to a point mass, you could see it means that the values, the realizations are also getting closer to the point mass. Okay, so intuitively, this will make sense. But if you see, I have this as Xn, I give this example before, and X is one minus Xm. If I define this way, then whenever this is zero, this is one. So they are actually, they are always far away from each other. Or maybe I put it, make it more extreme, like Bernoulli. Right, so the, whenever this is one, this is zero, this is zero, this is one. So they never get close and they cannot be converging, converging probability, but they have the same distribution or one half, yeah. They have the same distribution. So that's why convergence in law doesn't imply convergence in probability. But whenever the limit is a constant, the story is different. So let's see why this happens. So let's first take a look at this proof, right? So what we will do here is to make use of the constant as the result. So to prove this, and I'm still talking about a one dimensional case just for simplicity in the lecture notes it's a little more general two dimensional. So we have, we want to have for any epsilon positive X and minus C greater or less or equal than epsilon. We want this to converge to one. But then what does this imply? Right, so we can just open up the absolute value. We know X is in the absolute neighbor, Xn is in the absolute neighborhood of C. So this is equal to C minus epsilon, less or equal than Xn, less or equal than C plus epsilon, right? And now I can write this in terms of the CDF of Xn. That's what I have for convergence in law. And you see, the nice thing here for having a constant limit is if you recall, I said the probability is concerning x, n, and x jointly. But now c is a constant. So this is only concerning the distribution of x, and x, x n only. And that's nice. So you see, basically, we know how this can be written, right? It can be written as x, n less or equal than c plus epsilon minus the probability xn less than c minus epsilon. And now, because of the convergence in law, you know, I can do what? I can actually let this be as n goes to infinity, right? Because of a convergence in law, I can have this as the probability of x x less than c minus epsilon. Okay, and what else? So how can I say this thing? Am I right? Did I miss something here? 
I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. X is one. The, the limit is Z, C. Mm. So are you saying, maybe you can be more specific. <laughs> so can someone translate <laughs> or someone who heard him? Or maybe you can come, come forward if you want. <laughs> X and goes to C. Yes. yes. Right. That's right. Thanks. Yeah. That's right. So basically, the limit, right? We're saying the limit is going to be C. Right. We are saying X and is converging in probability to C. And then you see what will happen here. So maybe I will not write it this way. But we'll see as n goes to infinity, then xn will become a point mass at c for here and also for here. And then what's the CDF function for that point mass? We know this one is going to, because as this goes to a point mass at c, right? We know this is going to one and this is going to zero. So that's why we have the convergence. Thanks for catching up. Right, so this is the case when we can just go from convergence in law to convergence in probability. And I think this is a very important result to know. Okay, and for the second and the third result, so they will both rely on the I would say dominated convergent theorem for the proof. So I think I'm not going to prove it here, but you can check the notes for the detailed proof. I'm just going to give you the result here. So the result is about when can we go from almost sure convergence to um, convergence in the arc mean? We just gave you a counterexample, right? We know it doesn't hold for sure, but whenever we can have some control on the arc power of the sequence, then we can have that result. So this result is when we have almost sure convergence and we have the x n to the power r controlled under some random variable z with expectation of z finite. This is very similar to the condition, the dominated convergence theorem. You can see that. Then we have Xn converge in the rth mean to X. So this also tells you the difference between actually. So just don't confuse, I need to make a clarification. So here, don't confuse the convergence of this. Okay, so let me just say that. Mm -hmm. This is not the same as this. The right hand side is what we call the convergence in R mean. So, in other words, expectation is about a joint distribution, but this is not. This is just marginal distribution of Xn and marginal distribution of x. So don't confuse those two. By proving this doesn't imply you can prove convergence in the mean. So to prove this, just check the notes. It is a direct application of the dominated convergence theorem. Okay, that's the second partial result. So you see, to go from almost sure convergence to convergence in the mean. The key is to control the expectation of the arc power of Xn. Right, because you see, this condition actually implies for the expectation of this, it's also finite. 
Okay. And another result is related. And this result actually has a name called Sheffield's Sheffield's theorem. So in this result, what we have is almost sure convergence and non-negativity for the sequence and expectation of Xn converges to the expectation of X, which is finite. So with those conditions, we would have expectation of X in minus X converged to zero. So you see, this is a special case of the Rth mean convergence with R equals one. And what's special here is that we know expectation convergence doesn't imply this, right? Again, this is two marginal expectations. This is a joint one. But together with this almost sure convergence and the non-negativity, we can go to that convergence with R equals one. Okay, so for those two results, I think it is something you may know. Okay, yeah, one, well, there's some conditions about the behavior of the expectation of my random variable sequence, I may go from almost sure convergence to convergence R mean, and that should be enough. And the final partial result, I think it's particularly interesting, is the how can we go from P to almost surely? We give you a counter example to say that's not possible, but it's not possible for the whole sequence. However, with the convergence in the probability, it's possible to find a subsequence that converges almost surely. And that's very interesting. So let's still start from the intuition and then we will go to the math. So whenever we have Xn, converges in probability to X. This is equivalent to say that for any subsequence, let me just say, I call that um, any subsequence, I call say Xn1, Xn2, and so on. So this is a subsequence picked from my original sequence. For example, this could be n1 equals two, n2 equals four, n3 equals six, and so on. And for any subsequence, there exists a subsequence of the subsequence. I just say sub subsequence. I pick from here. And I say, I call that x n1 xm2, and so on. So this is a subsequence of that, such that this xmj goes to, converges almost surely to x as j goes to infinity. Okay, so it's not very easy to understand at a first glance, but if you think about it, it just means that no matter how I pick a subsequence from the original sequence, I can always pick a sub subsequence from what I have so that the sub subsequence converges. And this result has practical use because as I, as I said, it's often easier to work with almost sure convergence because they like the convergence of real numbers. So we have a lot of math to play with this. So then because of this equivalence, once we want convergence in probability, we can prove if this holds, right? For any subsequence, can I have a sub subsequence with almost sure convergence? So you can see the logic is like, if I have, um, I have probability convergence, I want to know after, after some transformation, can I still keep the convergence in probability? To answer the question, I first go this route, go to this convergence almost surely. I apply the transformation and see if it holds here. 
And if so, so like a continuous function transformation. If it holds, and I can go back to probability. So you see, I'm using the almost sure convergence as a tool for proving the convergence in probability. And how do we prove that? So this is actually related to what we have for the alternative definition. So for the alternative definition, we can actually write, okay, so let's just say that for, and this is something we want to introduce as a concept, just to write this alternative definition in another way. All right, so I'll just say that for x and j, okay, I just say this. What this means is that by definition two, it means that I can have for any epsilon positive, the probability that x and j minus x larger than epsilon or yeah i think i can say it larger than epsilon this event it doesn't happen that often so what i want to say is that if i want to look at this event and for all the j's okay and for the odd and odd j's in the sequence. I want to say that this event doesn't happen infinitely often. So short as i dot o dot. So I want to say this probability is zero. So it's just another way to rewrite this definition. The original definition is that for any epsilon, I can always find a subsequence that satisfy this neighborhood requirement, which means that this less or equal than epsilon event happens infinitely often in the sequence. But I'm now changing this to greater than. I'm saying that it doesn't happen infinitely often. So why do I want to use this notation infinitely often? The reason is because I'm going to use a famous result the burial Cantelli lemma to help us prove this. So I think to help us understand this better next time, I will suggest that everyone go back and read the burial Cantelli lemma first. I think you must have learned this from your probability class before. So we're going to apply that result here and to show why this will hold. And it's a very interesting result. So first of all, from this part to this part is easy. So just think, how can I go from the subsequence almost sure convergence to conversion probability? I think everybody should be able to do this. Okay, so then the difficult part is from probability to the subsequence. And in that case, we are going to use the burial Cantelli lemma and to show that, yeah, indeed we can. So basically this lemma will guarantee that we will have this in this event happen infinitely often equal to zero. So that's actually the first statement of the lemma. So we'll stop here and just try to read that lemma by yourself. And we'll just complete this part when we come back next time. So after the beginning of next time, when we finish talking about this, we will move on to talking about convergence in law specifically because that will be a very important part of this lecture. So I would like to say that for this class, in my opinion, I think the abstraction level is going to be easier as we go later into the class. I think the beginning is the most important part because we talk about all the probability. But later, I think you will find when we just talk about convergence in, in law, more often things should be easier to, yeah, I think compared, yeah, in, in terms of the abstraction level. So, and also for your information, homework one was posted, right? But you will have plenty of time to work on the problem. So uh, my suggestion is to just start early so you have enough time. All right, see you on Wednesday.